Uh, good evening. Um, I'm Ken Warren, a professor in the Department of English, and it's my pleasure and honor to join uh, my um, uh, uh, previous uh, uh, introducers, University of Chicago President Robert Zimmer, Dean of the Humanities, Anne Robertson, and my colleagues, uh, Professor Cliff Ando and Professor Jonathan Lear. In prefacing Danielle Allen's wonderful Berlin lectures with a few remarks of welcome and contextualization. Danielle Allen is not only my former colleague and dean in the humanities, humanities division, but she is also my former neighbor with whom for several years, I literally shared a wall in a Victorian duplex in Hyde Park, where we tried with varying degrees of success to broker peaceful relations between our dogs and to coax reluctant grass to grow in our deeply shaded backyards. And where we also managed from time to time to include within our neighborly pleasantries some serious scholarly observations. Although I've evoked the physical proximity of our homes by way of describing Professor Allen as a neighbor, I want to linger over that word neighbor for a moment because of the import it takes in Professor Allen's political philosophy, especially in her 2004 University of Chicago Press book, Talking to Strangers, Anxieties of Citizenship Since Brown versus the Board of Education. Not simply a casual way of referring to those to whom one habitually waves at or says hello while passing in the streets. Neighbor, for Danielle, denotes and connotes the complex of interrelations that undergirds the possibility of founding and sustaining a democratic polity. At the intersection of these, of these relations is the need to establish trust and solidarity among citizens across differences and across distances in order to enable collective action for the common good. The challenge for Danielle has been to understand what stands in the way of our ability to feel neighborly towards our fellow citizens whom we don't know and, and don't see regularly and to extend to them the kind of trust and obligation that we usually reserve for our proximate neighbors whom we might ask actually to look after our dog or pick up our mail when we are out of town. Her goal has been to define and, and to describe the behaviors and institutions that have the possibility of enabling that kind of fellow feeling at scale. Another element that I share with Professor Allen, one that bears pertinently on this question of neighborliness and solidarity is our mutual interest in and admiration of the work of novelist and essayist Ralph Ellison about whom I've written a book and whom Danielle names as the guiding spirit of talking to strangers. There are few novelists who can match Ellison's unsentimental commitment to the democratic possibilities of the American political condition. Fully aware of the insufficiencies of democracy as lived during his lifetime, and I should say it during ours as well, particularly its shortcomings when it came to extending full citizenship to those to whom it had made outsiders, Ellison nonetheless remained optimistic, if not certain, that a renewed dedication to the nation's founding principles could create a society for which its citizens would be willing to sacrifice apparent immediate gains for the common good. What motivated the argument of talking to strangers was Danielle's contention that the promise, the lessons and the insights of the civil rights era, which had inspired Ellison's marvelous essays, had not yet been incorporated into a refounding of the nation's guiding ideals. Although the crucial fault line for this failure was the production and maintaining of the idea of racial difference, the challenge, according to Professor Allen, extended beyond repairing the relations between the nation's black and white citizens. In her words, this democracy has repeatedly failed to develop forms of citizenship that help break down distrust and generate trust a failing closely linked to a second failure to develop citizenly habits that can contend with the unequal distribution of benefits and burdens inevitably produced by political decisions. Those of us who have listened to Professor Allen last week and yesterday have been shown how the inadequacies of the nation's response to the COVID-19 pandemic have exposed some of the inadequacies of our democratic institutions many of which Professor Allen warned us, of, warned us of more than 15 years ago. 
We now await this evening to hear more from her about the possibility of a post-pandemic future for democratic society. Uh, uh, Professor Allen will be speaking a little uh, uh, for a little shorter time this, uh, this evening in order to allow for more discussion and more questions. So please join me in welcoming Professor Danielle Allen for her final 2020 Berlin lecture, A Transformed Peace. Thank you so much, Professor Warren. Ken, that was really a wonderful, lovely introduction. And um, the one thing you didn't mention about our neighborly um, efforts to collaborate was how much time and energy and creativity we put into trying to trap squirrels and remove them from our attic, which crossed, um, crossed the wall in, in various ways. So I think there's something in that experience of trying to trap squirrels that uh, is not unlike trying to trap um, and remove a virus, I think. And yes, neighborly action um, is what we need um, in order to, to beat this particular one. But it's such a pleasure to be here and, and talking with you again this evening. I want to say thank you again as well to everybody who's come along for the journey on these four lectures. I'm so grateful to you for your time and attention and for the amazing questions that you've already contributed. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and conversation this evening. I also wanted to say thank you again to the Berlin family and thank you especially to Randy. Randy, I said this the first night, but I learned so much from you uh, during my time in Chicago that I'm truly honored and gratified to be able to be here as a Berlin family lecturer. My remarks tonight are under the title, A Transformed Peace. Already before this pandemic hit, we faced a silent legitimacy crisis. Fewer than 30% of people under the age of 40 thought that it is essential to live in a democracy. I expect we face a worse crisis now for legitimacy. The pandemic has taught us a dark truth. We don't know in conditions of emergency that we will be okay together. Too many people were willing to abandon our elders. Too many people were equally willing to abandon essential workers. Too many people have been willing to abandon the young. Too many people are willing to abandon Black and Hispanic Americans. Too many are willing to abandon rural Americans. Too many people are willing to cede liberties indefinitely or use them abusively. If in conditions of emergency, we can't count on support from one another, then how do the institutions we share together have any legitimacy? Why across this crisis have too many of us been willing to give voice to a desire to abandon others among us? I think the answer is fear. Fear for one's own self-preservation has inspired too many to contemplate openly or secretly the abandonment of others. Why do we have this fear? We have this fear because we don't have grounds for confidence, but in conditions of emergency, we will be okay together. Why don't we have grounds for such confidence? Because actually in conditions of peace, we're not okay together. In conditions of peace, we've abandoned our elders. In conditions of peace, we've abandoned essential workers. In conditions of peace, we've abandoned the young. In conditions of peace, we've abandoned Black and Hispanic Americans. In conditions of peace, we've abandoned rural Americans. And in conditions of peace, we abandoned education into the meaning and value of constitutional democracy and good governance among free and equal citizens. Why should we expect more of ourselves in times of emergency than in times of peace? Frontline healthcare workers have brought to this fight a commitment to their fellow residents of this great land that has gone only partially matched by the rest of us. Those healthcare workers didn't develop new capacities in a moment of emergency. They took the same standards of care, commitment, and service that shaped their daily lives in peace 
into this crisis. We yearn for a vision of a future beyond this pandemic. One after another magazine keeps asking me to submit a piece sketching what the world will look like after in a post pandemic. But I think to ask this question this way is a mistake. This pandemic hasn't changed us or our world. It has simply revealed facts about us to ourselves. It's the old saw, a crisis teaches you who you really are. The world post pandemic will look like a lot like our world pre pandemic, unless we change who we are. We were vulnerable as a society to COVID-19 because we are not committed to one another or to our constitutional democracy. This disease will spread much more broadly in our society than it would have done if our first society-wide instinct in response to that first shock of the disease's arrival had been to marshal the resources necessary to protect the elderly, essential workers, the young, rural Americans, whether white, black, or Hispanic, poor urban Americans, whether Hispanic, black, or white. This disease will spread far wider in our society than it would have done if our go-to instinct with our liberties in response to the first shock have been to develop the resources and processes of good governance and to engage eager defenders of liberty in the question of how we defend our society, lives, livelihoods, and liberties simultaneously. Our frontline healthcare workers took into this pandemic the pre-existing peacetime commitments they had to others in our society. The rest of us took into this pandemic our pre-existing peacetime commitments to ourselves and our tribal communities. We won't reach the end of this pandemic and then have the chance to develop a transformed peace. If we wish to transform our peace, we will have to affect that transformation during the course of this pandemic. For our pre-existing peace is still with us. It defines our response to the virus. Fear stokes greed, the desire to close the doors and wall out and to protect whatever mine I am currently able to lay my hands on. Greed was always there, but fear makes it worse. How do we exercise greed? We all seek safety and happiness in the words of the Declaration of Independence. If my society can deliver to me a sense of safety, can I relinquish my fear? Will that help me repudiate my greed? Can I see that the only path to safety for any of us in this pandemic is through a broad public project for building safety through disease suppression? On university campuses with high powered research facilities, my own included, it is very easy to imagine running a program just for us that would make it possible for us to open safely. But this would be like responding to terrorism by encouraging every civil society organization to build its own private security core. Those with resources are protected, everyone else is not. A blameworthy shrug of acceptance on the part of the comfortable sets our course in this direction. What's the alternative? With terrorism, we built a broad public infrastructure of security, ranging from airport security checkpoints to new ways of monitoring public transportation to the ongoing work of people investigating specific threats and networks. Yes, we can see a certain amount of additional private security in our world that has emerged since the events of September 11th. One can't enter many high-rise buildings now without showing an ID, for instance. But the broad structures of public security mean that everybody is included in the umbrella of protection and uses of private security are minimized. We must achieve the same thing now. Between now and the start of the school year, we have enough time to build broad public testing and contact tracing programs for the whole of our society that can decelerate and clear out the disease by following chains of transmission, finding every COVID positive case and supporting people in voluntary isolation. Yes, it will be good to have civil society organizations like the University of Chicago and Brown and UCSD helping this public endeavor by contributing resources and support of their communities. So they should do this as part of a comprehensive and universal infrastructure, not by contributing yet another brick to the ever-growing wall, separating the haves from the have-nots. The idea that we need to rebuild security for all of us through investment in public goods is the best way of capturing 
what a social contract is. A healthy social contract depends on near universal recognition that there are important goods we all want that we can provision for ourselves much better together than individually. Response to a pandemic is such a public good. The entire point of political institutions, that is of a social contract consisting of rights and responsibilities, is to deliver public goods of this kind. Security wards off fear. Escape from fear diminishes the ravening power of greed. It's good to have a release from greed because the public thing that will deliver security to me also requires my contribution to it, a contribution to this public thing that will improve my life. We'll have to accept higher taxes. Our acceptance of higher taxes should flow from our desire to protect our elders, to provide security and opportunity to essential workers, to set the young on a course to exceed their parents in well being, to include Black, Hispanic, and rural Americans fully in governance, empowerment, and security, to put our liberties to use through practices of good governance. The foundation for health is a right. Schools are how we currently try to provide that foundation for health something we have not really been particularly attuned to. The pandemic though has made this visible, the truth about ourselves that we've been unwilling previously to see. As my colleague Mira Levinson in the Ed School here points out, it's schools that are delivering food, medical care, and sometimes even housing facilities, showers and the like to children who would otherwise go without. When the schools closed late this winter, the immediate crisis to be addressed was not a gap in student learning, but a more fundamental gap in student access to basic necessities. Schools have become our accidental infrastructure of welfare and we never even really noticed. We should accept higher taxes to build the public good, the structures of safety and happiness that protect all of us together far more effectively than we can achieve if we seek each to do so individually. This doesn't mean in turn that we abandon our personal responsibility for loving and respecting the specific older people or younger people or working people or poor urban or rural people who are in our immediate nexus of connection. To affirm the value of the public good is not to suggest that government should supplant all the good work that civil society does. It's rather to remind us that the good work that we do within our own immediate communities is the seed of an instinct that should be extended by means of our political institutions to embrace the whole of our society. If we can reclaim a commitment to a concept of the public good, then we too are lifted up and given a sturdier foundation for safety and happiness by the commitment of unnamed others to us, also channeled through our public institutions. In contemplating a nationwide system of testing, tracing, and supported isolation as the best response to this pandemic, a scientist colleague of mine told me that it was doable. He said, we don't have to break any laws of physics to do it. Of course we can do it. No, I said, all we have to do is break the laws of politics. Of course, the laws of politics are not ultimately separable from the laws of physics. After all, politics happens in time. Politics requires judgment. Judgment requires deliberation. Deliberation requires conversation and contestation among parties with widely varying possible ranges of polarization, competitiveness, or openness to agreement. The more the polarization and competition, the slower the process, the more time it takes. The current state of American politics is a physical barrier to successful response to a crisis under time pressure. Democracies always move more slowly than autocracies, even if in the end they can lay down more durable pathways because more legitimate pathways. But now, because of our heightened degree of internal conflict, the temporal dimensions of our politics are moving even more slowly than they might. It has turned out that the laws of our politics couldn't be broken quickly enough to achieve a national strategy for testing tracing and supported isolation that might have kept disease prevalence to low levels. 
there were laws of physics that had to be broken, it turned out, after all. Laws pertaining to the dynamics of time. It's just that those laws of physics were packaged as laws of politics. So we may have been more earthbound than we realized several months ago, as we all craved a solution to our woes. Nonetheless, the lesson persists. To achieve pandemic resilience now and for the future, we'll have to break laws of politics. We'll have to do this in order to recover our capacity to master time, something fundamentally necessary to handling a crisis. So in conclusion, let me begin the work of breaking some of the laws of politics. Read my lips. We need higher taxes. There are things we do need to pay for together. Read my lips. We also need smarter governance. Elections with real choices, ranked choice voting, for instance. A Congress that works. A Senate with independence from the presidency. Accepting higher taxes should be conditional on democracy reform, for example, campaign finance reform. That kind of bargain between higher taxes and democracy reform was the bargain struck via the Constitution. This is the bargain we need to strike again. Read my lips. We need activists who organize for governance, not just for power. That applies to both sides of the political spectrum. Finally, we, the consumers of contempt-driven media, need to stop consuming contempt-driven media. We don't get to wait for the pandemic to be over to hear the starting gun for working on a transformed peace. Whatever ways we work through this pandemic will deliver to us the peace that we will have. Consequently, if we wish for transformed peace, we must, as better late than never, begin to fight the pandemic with the following commitments in mind. We will protect our elders. We will provide security to essential workers. We will launch the young. We will empower and provide a foundation for health to poor rural and urban Americas, whether black, white, or brown. We will activate our liberties through support for good governance. If we can do these things, we will have transformed ourselves and peace will follow. Thank you. And uh, uh, thank you, um, Danielle, for that uh, uh, pithy, powerful, and um, challenging, I think, uh, conclusion to your remarks uh, uh, tonight. Um, I'd like to, we have several questions uh, um, queuing up here. And some have a, a specific focus on some of the recommendations that you've uh, made uh, and how those um, recommendations tie into the theme or the, uh, uh, the need for the kind of trust necessary to beat the challenge of our uh, democracy at this point. So one person asks that, uh, notes that the acceptance of higher taxes depends on trust that those who spend them can do so and will do so responsibly. Um, how can we get that trust back? Can you talk a little more about that? Absolutely. So that's why I paired acceptance of higher taxes with democracy reform. So mm -hmm. I think that a healthy democracy depends on a virtuous cycle of interaction among political institutions, civil society organizations, and a healthy political culture. And it's certainly the case that you can't fix a broken democracy by fixing only one of those things. It's about the interaction among them. And so I agree. I think that our political institutions, the way governance functions in Congress, um, those things are broken. Congress's approval rating in, I think it was 2013, hit 9%. Um, and it's, you know, it's managed to get back up to about 20%, and then it tends to come back down again. And that is a terrible indicator. Um, that is a sign that a democracy is broken at some fundamental level. Again, I go back to the argument I was making yesterday that the legislature should be seen as the first branch. And so if your trust in Congress is at that level, then you really do have a pretty serious legitimacy crisis on your hands. So I do think that we need a host of things like ranked choice voting, um, independent redistricting commissions across um, all states, a constitutional amendment um, rolling back the effects of Citizens United on campaign finance, 
um, really rigorous campaign disclosure rules and so forth so that we can be sure as we're working through an election process that we are actually electing people who are in a position to make independent decisions, independent judgments. Um, I could go on. I think there's sort of a host of reforms we need around voting as well, uh, other kinds of reforms that are aimed at responsive um, forms of government and democracy. But it's quite right to say that um, how, you know, it's not reasonable to ask for an acceptance of higher taxes unless there's also actually confidence in the quality of governance. So I think that working on those democracy reforms is a necessary part of rebuilding um, conviction that we can deliver on a concept of the public good that justifies um, taxes for that public good provision. Okay, uh, a follow-up, um, it's really coming from me, but it's something that I feel is uh, uh, lurking in the background of some of the um, observations here, it has to do with a term that you don't use a great deal in talking about um, our political um, structure, which are uh, political parties. And in terms right. of uh, establishing trust, how do you think that the current configuration of political parties uh, provides or functions as a barrier or for you perhaps provides a, an opportunity to move us in the direction that you have in mind? That's a great question. I have to admit, I think this is one of the weak spots in my own analysis for our situation. I don't think I have a terribly good answer, answer on the subject of parties. That is, it seems to me there's a bunch of conundra I was talking to somebody just a couple of days ago uh, who made the point that um, our current situation with our parties may be one of those rare examples of scholars actually having an influence in the sense that in the 1950s, the American Political Science Association published a report, um, the purpose of which was to argue that America's parties were insufficiently differentiated and that American democracy would be improved if the parties more strongly differentiated themselves from one another. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, 70 years later or whatnot. And well, we've achieved that differentiation, but it's not clear that we've achieved anything functional. So I think the thing that I'm stuck on on the question of parties is um, the vast percentage you know, of Americans who don't register for either party, right? And do they, in fact, constitute um, the basis for an alternative uh, movement in politics? Or is it really the case that they're just folks who haven't kind of formally committed to one side or the other, but they're as polarized as everybody else. And they're, so people assess the landscape in different ways in that regard. Um, so I think the question of how parties operate is a hugely challenging one. Um, for me, the thing that I focus on is the sort of way of addressing the problem of polarization that they represent is ranked choice voting, um, insofar as that changes habits of campaigning, it changes who's a viable candidate, um, because people have to campaign not just to be the first choice and therefore negatively against their opponents, but also to be people's second choice and third choice. Um, and so the thought is that that particular kind of electoral mechanism would in itself begin to drive some changes in behavior on the parts of the parties so that they were less invested in um, sort of forwarding the most polarizing candidates. Um, but, but I think that's it's one of the biggest issues and I think it's one of my biggest uh, blind spots, the place I need to do more work in thinking. Okay, thank you. We have, we have questions as well going to some of the more specific aspects of the uh, lectures that you've given us over the past uh, what, week, uh, a week or so. Uh, some have to do with uh, the extent to which uh, TTSI depends on um, the accuracy of the tests that are available and what is your sense of testing accuracy and is it sufficiently high to uh, give us confidence that the TTSI can work as a strategy? No, that's a great and important question. The conversation about testing has um, all kinds of things that are sort of confounding in it and one of the most confounding elements is the fact that there are two categories of tests. There are diagnostic tests to tell whether or not there's active presence of the virus and infectiousness on the one hand, and then there are antibody tests that don't tell you anything about whether the person's presently infectious, just tell you whether they've had the disease at some point in the past. And the TTSI arguments are focused on diagnostic testing. Those right. tests are very good. Um, there are reliability issues that tend to come from test administration. So for example, if somebody does not know well how to administer the nasal swab version, it's possible that you are more likely to get a false negative, for example. But the test itself is a highly re reliable, um, well-regarded um, approach to assessing um, infectiousness. Antibody tests are all over the map in terms of quality. And so that has made conversations about immunity extremely complicated. So 
I was more or less leaving the antibody side out of the picture um, okay. for that reason. So. Okay. Um, yeah, going in a slightly different direction, but again, addressing some of the um, um, remedies in some sense or the areas of focus that you touched on. Uh, one is uh, civic education. And um, wait, could you say more about how uh, we might um, establish a robust uh, program of civic education? Sure. Well, watch out, because this one you can get me going on for, you know, <laughs> extended periods of time. So, I mean, first, just to sort of recap some history, um, you know, it matters that in World War II, um, the country really invested in the intellectual infrastructure of the country in the sense of um, investing in the Manhattan Project and pulling research universities into big science in order to beat the Germans to producing um, an atomic weapon. And that was really the beginning of a serious sort of scientization of society, real investment in science across the board, um, including in science education. So that World War II investment was then followed uh, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik by a decision on the part of the White House that it was time to invest specifically in science education and sort of billions of dollars poured into science education at that point. And then that was reinforced in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan with the sort of report of Nation at Risk that treated the U.S. educational system as if, uh, I think there's a line in the report that says something like, you know, if an enemy had devised an attack on America um, that involved eroding the educational system, like this would be what resulted, like the system we have now. So that generated another kind of round of investment and reform, but again, the framework for that was all about um, competitiveness, economic competitiveness, and national security competitiveness, and the investments flowed again in the direction of STEM education. So, and again, every decade has been a repeat of this structure uh, with the result that, as I, I keep sort of mentioning, there's now incredible discrepancy between federal dollars invested in STEM education for kids each year versus civics education. So the point is that we have been investing in pulling our educational system in the direction of STEM for the last 50 plus years. And so if you know, my answer to the question, what do we need for civic education? is a parallel investment in civic education. 50 years worth of billions of dollars um, invested in rebuilding connections between colleges and universities in the K through 12 system, um, in the humanities, in social sciences. Um, you would never let a biology class sort of enter into a high school that wasn't um, uh, integrated with the state of the art knowledge coming out of research universities in biology. You know, we no longer seek to infuse the intellectual energy and capacity of research universities into the K-12 curriculum in social studies, um, English language arts, things like that. History, a little more so. There's more connection with history. So there's a real like, rebuilding of the basic intellectual infrastructure connecting K-12 through to colleges mm -hmm. and universities as necessary. And we need more time in school, okay, for civics. So the other suggestion I would make in this current moment, when we can't play sports in big arenas, that we should take all the time and money we put into sports and put it into civics. At least for two years, we should do really serious investment in civics since we can't play football and things like that. Um, and maybe that would start putting us on a path of recognizing what we can do with this kind of investment. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I, I think uh, some of the other questions might be uh, um, um, follow from that because you mentioned in terms of other things that we might do, to uh, change our um, situation at present would be to reduce our uh, uh, appetite for our consumption and our participation in, in contempt-based media as a, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a cultural product. Do you think that that's also related to uh, civic education as you've defined it here? That's a great question. I mean, we, we certainly have a media ecosystem that is insufficient to our civic needs. So in that regard, I do think it's linked. And I think there, there are a number of ways I would talk about that though, right? So we're used to talking about food deserts and the, the absence of fresh foods from certain communities. Well, we also equally well have high quality news deserts. Um, so, you know, local news has been decimated. Um, I was just reading something today that pointed out that 37% um, of the counties in America that have had um, COVID cases no longer have any no local news coverage, right? So even in their local community, they're not able to see what's happening um, immediately around them with regard mm -hmm. to COVID. So there's a hole, there's a hole for local news coverage. Um, there is a hole it, with regard to um, standard setting sort of for helping people discriminate between things that are of 
um, high quality investigative journalism versus uh, sort of stuff that's not well founded, doesn't use evidence in good ways. And I think that standard setting work actually um, would function better at a more local level. So I think it doesn't work well when it's about elites from distant places hectoring people about the quality of their media. I think it works much better when you have local standard bearers who are advocating for high standards um, in news media, media literacy. So for example, um, there's an organization in Lexington, Kentucky called Civic Lex, which is really rebuilding um, the space of media for that community. I think of them as building civic media, right? So like not social media, which has got all kinds of negative stuff, but civic media where they're doing explanatory reporting about local issues, including the local budgets, municipal bu budgets and the like, um, local investigative journalism. And then they're also connecting that to um, spaces where citizens and office holders can meet to talk about the reporting that's being done with the main uh, sort of requirement being that there's never more than uh, seven constituent members to each office holder. So like every seven people deserve one office holder for direct conversation is the concept. Um, so they're, they're building a whole new kind of ecosystem for media engagement. Um, and I think that captures a need that we collectively have that's not being filled by sort of national media, but which has to be rebuilt by us changing our consumption habits and by local um, sort of civil society organizations um, coordinating to start to deliver things that meet healthier appetites. Again, like with the, the food desert being a kind of analogy for, for what we need. So um, the civic society organizations that you just mentioned, particularly the one in, um, in Kentucky, is that an example of what you mean by when you, when you in, in speaking to activists of the need to organize for govern governance and rather than organizing for power? One question is, has been, how do you, do, how do you produce that distinction? What is that actually, uh, what, in what ways does that cash out? So that's a great question. And yes, I mean, that is part of what I mean about organizing for governance and not just for power. So I think, um, you know, we live in an age of social movements. I mean, so, you know, we live in an age where social movements are as frequent and common as in the 1960s. And that is a wonderful thing to watch democracy in action. Um, I think a lot of social movement work has really focused on um, getting power in the sense of being able to change um, the shape of the public conversation, being able to claim attention for a cause. But then there's the sort of next step, which is about converting um, alliances and solidarities and so forth into stable, durable uh, processes for governance. So I'm not saying that so it was commonly said about Occupy, for example, right, that they didn't have a policy platform and that was the problem. And that's not what I mean. I'm not objecting to the absence of a sort of, you know, 10 point policy statement or something like that. It's rather the point that um, you have to convert a position and the fact that you've got allies and attention and solidarity into a way of working through decisions, including with people who are on the other side from you, that results in something that is stable over time as a governance outcome. And so that's when I sort of you know, try to talk about the combination of judgment and underlying processes of deliberation and contestation um, and how you sort of drive from setting the agenda through to the conclusion of a decision and an implementation, that's what I'm talking about as being governance. Okay, I think that's, I think that's very helpful. We have a number of questions focusing um, um, on the more, say, immediate tasks. Uh, well, all of these tasks are immediate, I think, as you've laid them out. <laughs> but with respect yeah. to thinking about how we get from now to, um, um, where we would like to be in the, in the fall. And one question simply has to do with um, uh, your sense of the teams that are currently working, the academic and governmental teams to contributing knowledge to finding a solution. Uh, what's your uh, assessment of, or your, your sense of what teams are there and your assessment of the alignment sort of between and among those teams? Do we have the kind of coordination as yet that we, that we will need to tackle this at this moment? Not yet is the short answer to that question. Um, that, that question is really beautifully put. Um, so we have all the intellectual resources that we need in the sense that the science is out there, there are legal scholars who are out there, there are economists. Um, they are only just beginning, I think, to learn how to actually work together across those silos of expertise. 
And I think that's a matter of kind of overcoming some intellectual bad habits of the last few decades where we've just, you know, we are increasingly siloed, you know, economists don't talk to public health, you know, experts don't talk to philosophers, et cetera. And so everybody's got a kind of partial view um, and people have lost the habit of knowing how to integrate those views. So we have the resources in terms of just, you know, basic expertise across domains. We have less depth in terms of our ability to integrate those expertise, forms of expertise. And then with regard to government teams, I think, so there, here's some stuff I think people should really pay attention to. Um, so in my argument about Congress being the first branch, that's true, technically speaking, structurally speaking. Mm -hmm. It's also potentially true in reality. But right now, um, Congress is under-equipped with staffing resources, and so actually doesn't have the capacity to research issues and drive intellectual agendas for the most part. And this is one of the least um, publicly recognized results of the Newt Gingrich Contract for America moment, which stripped funding out of uh, congressional offices and really shrank the quantity of legislative staff. And what that has meant is that Congress no longer has the same kind of depth of expertise or access to expertise to drive policymaking conversations. So there's a real conversation to be had about how Congress actually operates uh, that could go a long way to achieving improvements in our overall uh, process of governance. But so, so no, Congress right now does not have the intellectual resources that it needs. That's the short answer to the question. That's not a knock on Congress people. That's a structural feature of how Congress currently operates and the kinds of budget allocations made to Congress for staffing purposes. Okay. So one follow-up, and I'll, you laid out some of these in your first uh, lecture, but I think in light of what you've described now, if you had to um, enumerate again what you think would be the necessary steps, say, over the next few months with the summer, and particularly for those of us in academic institutions where people are talking about the policy of opening up, what would be the first, most necessary steps to put TTSI in operation in such a way that it could actually lead to the kinds of outcomes you've been uh, uh, describing for us? You know, I, I have a list, so I'm gonna actually share my screen for a second. Okay. So I think every state should set up a TTSI task force at the level of the governor's office, okay? Um, so right now, you know, most states have a kind of economic task force and they have a public health task force. They might have a testing task force. And the problem with this world of testing, tracing, and supported isolation is that it requires putting pieces together in a way that nobody's ever sort of visualized that structure of connection and coordination previously. And so without a task force bringing the relevant kinds of expertise together, nobody sees the whole thing. And so everybody's sort of stuck in this world where they're seeing parts of what's necessary and don't even know how to think about the other part. So the people doing contact tracing don't even know how to think about how you ramp up lab capacity to do testing, for example. And did other people doing capacity in labs have no idea how you think about getting contact tracers who can function effectively in communities and be trusted in communities and things like that. So you have to have a task force structure and it should be at the level of the governor's office. And then you need really clear metrics for people to focus on. A key one would be that for every COVID positive test, there are 25 more tests done with individuals directed to testing via contact tracing. If for every, every time somebody tested COVID positive, we were getting another 25 people to tests, to being tested, we would be testing enough to be chasing the disease down and taking it out of circulation. Um, ditto, another metric is that there's capacity for routine testing in critical contexts. So that's correctional facilities, healthcare, worker contexts, uh, workplaces where people have sort of um, production line or assembly line style work, so like meat packing plants, um, elder care facilities. Another key metric is the positivity rate. The target should be 4%, which is the rate you need to be down to if you're actually suppressing the disease as opposed to simply mitigating it. Um, those governors and task forces should be held responsible for building culturally competent contact tracing teams. We could do public education around do-it-yourself contact tracing, just like in, you know, HIV AIDS context, know your status, right? And if you test positive, you know, what's your commitment to your own community to, to tell your friends and contacts and so forth that you may have unwittingly exposed them um, to COVID-19. You know, we can do this for ourselves. We don't actually need contact tracers, so to speak, to do this. Um, we need that same task force to work on providing supports for isolation and the public education work also needs to clarify how tests are paid for 
and that there should be universality of access to diagnostic tests and treatment. This last point is like the masks issue, right, where the CDC told everybody don't wear masks. And so then it, then it reversed its guidance. And then we all had to kind of spin around in you know, with this crazy, confusing way trying to figure out, do we, don't we wear masks? What does this actually mean? The same thing has happened with tests. The CDC said, don't test asymptomatic people. So most people still think you can't get a test if you have no symptoms. That is no longer true. And in, in, there are still some states that say if you don't have symptoms, you can't get a test and that needs to change. But in general, the word has not gone out to the broad public that you can get a test without symptoms, a diagnostic test without symptoms. So here's the list of things that I think that we need to do in every state. So that's the hard part is we actually have to do it in 56 states and territories you know, rather than doing it, you know, once for the nation as a whole. That's where we are. That's the fact of the situation. Um, it will bring some benefits to do it in every state because things could be tailored to the context of the state. But I really think every state needs that TTSI task force. I'm, I'm glad they asked that question because I think uh, I gave you the opportunity to go back through uh, points that you've uh, made, but in a, in a more bulleted uh, way. Um, picking up on some features of this, what do you think about the particular challenge, um, say that, uh, you know, uh, undocumented um, um, uh, citizens, I'll call them, <laughs> um, 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 uh, have in, um, uh, um, well, what challenge, I guess, do you feel that, you know, the kinds of issues around, um, you know, the presence of undocumented workers in the United States um, um, uh, pose for a, an effective um, pandemic uh, response? Well, we all have to um, accept that everybody here is a part of our community and pandemic protection for all of us depends on protecting all of us. So that does mean overcoming a lot of instincts that go the opposite direction. So for example, I was on a phone call earlier today with um, a group of people working on local level um, organizing around um, COVID. And I think this particular, yes, this, this came from uh, Dallas, I believe this story, um, was that in fact, you in the relevant location, or it may have been Louisiana, I'm not sure, Texas or Louisiana, in the relevant location, um, you had to have a government issued ID in order to get a test, okay? I mean, that is just a travesty in terms of what mm -hmm. the whole society needs from a public health point of view. I mean, you, you just need people to get tests. You should not be putting obstacles in the way of getting tests, period, at any rate. And then the local resolution ended up being that um, the relevant community were all connected to one very, very large church, which, as it happens, issued parish IDs. And so the undocumented workers were able to use their parish IDs ultimately to get a test. So it was a workaround, right? But that sort of speaks mm -hmm. to your point. Um, the policy should never be set up to require a government ID for a diagnostic test for COVID. Um, that is a foolhardy, foolish policy. Um, and yes, um, so we need to figure out how do we dig into our resources of persuasion um, to bring people to see that in, you know, above all in the context of a pandemic, you know, if, if not more generally, the, Above all, in the context of the pandemic, we have to recognize that everybody in this country is a part of this country's community, and we will be healthy together or not healthy at all. Um, so, you know, it's just a really important point to, to try to drive home. In, in your response to some earlier questions, you um, did um, were asked to remark on uh, the responses in other um, uh, places around the globe to the to the pandemic and. And people are wondering, do you see any common features among the, those uh, nations and societies that have responded in a way that you feel is, uh, is, is more positive? Uh, some have uh, observed that uh, among the states that have really stood out for a positive response is that they're led by women. Um, All right. <laughs> uh, do you have any thoughts about what has actually contributed from the standpoint of leadership to mm -hmm. effective uh, COVID-19 uh, responses in other countries? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the thing that has been most salient for me has just been the fact of the countries that learned from SARS, right, from the sort of 2003 SARS epidemic. So, um, you know, that certainly is fundamental to the success of 
Taiwan and Hong Kong and South Korea, and also um, separately Singapore and China. They're in a different category, but you know, also New Zealand and Australia, right? So that entire sort of nexus of the world um, had a, a real sh initial shock with SARS. And SARS is not as bad as this, um, but they learned and they built in um, the infrastructure of pandemic resilience. So when things hit, um, they knew what to do and they knew how to activate the contact tracing, the testing capacity and things like that. So they didn't wait. They didn't wait at all. They didn't have to sort of stop and think about what to do. They already had their strategy. So I think that's actually the most important thing. And so, you know, if, if there's any silver lining, I mean, this is a horrible silver lining, but I think, you know, I think we'll be ready for the next one. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's, it's a terrible thing. It's like, we, we've been learning through this rather than having learned from the experience of others, which is what we ought to have done. Um, so, um, so that, that's the thing that stands out most to me, to be honest. Okay, in terms of um, you know, renewing our political culture, do you think there are um, lessons to uh, be learned from, um, other movements to expand our democracy and democratic rights and citizen rights in the past, uh, say the campaign to achieve marriage equality, for example, or the civil rights mm -hmm. movement. Do you feel that there are um, ways in which the success of those movements might be um, 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 informative about how to, to meet the current challenge? So it's interesting. I mean, I think there are lots of important lessons from those movements. Um, I wonder though whether we actually are at a point where we need different kinds of lessons. So um, I think both the civil rights movement and the marriage equality movement have taught important lessons about the fact that um, you know change gets made from the bottom up. Change doesn't just descend that you have to push and this is where you do have to organize for power. Um, you do have to organize to change the agenda shift people's attention and so forth. The marriage equality movement, you know, drove home really important lessons about public narrative, um, the sort of switch of frame from gay rights to marriage equality. The, uh, political scientist Steve Woodley has shown what a huge impact that had in terms of uh, making the cause something that um, a very broad swath of Americans could relate to. So whereas people couldn't relate to gay rights because that was for a specific subset of people, marriage equality is for everybody. If marriage is something that might be for everybody, equality is something that's for everybody. And so there was a kind of universal um, embrace in that marriage equality frame that was very powerful. So I think both of those lessons matter, but I think we actually face a different lesson now, which is that um, it is, uh, I mean, how to put it, I mean, it's, it's, it's what I try to kind of um, put under the heading of breaking the laws of politics. And, um, you know, I wrote an, an op-ed piece a couple of weeks ago where, you know, it was, it was my like, I'm gonna break the laws of politics op-ed. And it basically started out by saying something that I thought President Trump had done right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, really went against my own intuitions and grains to do, but there was, but there was a thing I did think he had actually done right. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna break the laws of politics. I'm gonna say this out loud. I'm gonna put this on paper and I'm gonna try to build from that to the next set of things I want to say. And, um, you know, that um, opened up conversations uh, in ways that were actually useful and productive. And in addition, um, it, the other thing that it did, the thing that I've experienced is that sort of, um, you know, we really do operate in intellectual silos um, that are ideological. And it, it, this really does produce blind spots for people on both sides. And I think that we are less effective politically because of those blind spots. And the only way you could actually get out of those blind spots is if you literally talk to somebody with whom you now have a kind of deeply ingrained habit of the idea that you should actually never interact with them. And so it's like a sort of hyper, I, 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 it is my kind of talking to strangers argument, but sort of like talking to strangers on steroids. I think that we actually um, need to seek out uh, conversations with our ideological adversaries, but not just conversations, we need to actually try to do things with our ideological adversaries as much because it goes so against the grain as anything else. That is like the only way I can see to like break the laws of politics is like to do stuff that feels like you're breaking a law of politics, if you see what I mean. So yeah, I can see that. What about um, this, here's a question uh, about the, the notion of the common good that you mentioned so often, the idea of the public good and the common good. Um, 
does that concept actually work as a way of um, uh, talking to both sides in such a highly competitive global environment? I don't think it works as a starting point. I don't think I don't think you can kind of walk into a room and say, "Okay, people, let's find the common good." I don't think you get anywhere if you do that. <laughs> okay. So in that regard, I agree. Um, so then the question is, well, what do you actually mean, Danielle, in that case? Um, and what I mean is, I think it's, it's what I was trying to articulate at the end of my remarks tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start with some commitments that are about not abandoning people. Okay, can we, can we just agree that we're like, not gonna abandon people? <laughs> can, can we just do that, you know? Like, let's start with that, okay? We're gonna walk into this room and we're gonna agree that we're not gonna abandon people. And then we're gonna like also acknowledge it's actually really hard to figure out like what the pathway is to not abandoning anybody. All right, it's not, it's not obvious like the pathway where you like abandon people in nursing homes is like easier to see or the pathway where you like keep the economy closed forever and like really do damage to young people for perpetuity is like easier to see. All right, so we're gonna like mm -hmm. also acknowledge that from, like we're not gonna take any of those easy paths that involve, involve abandoning people. Like we're just not, like that's just like ruled off from the get-go. All right, like now let's figure out what other paths become visible. And then I think that like by definition, those paths are common good paths. And you never actually had to say that. Like all you had to like actually agree was like, we're not gonna abandon people, okay? Um, so that's sort of what I feel like is a kind of a, a way to start uh, rebuilding um, the habits the, of inquiry um, and decision-making that lead you towards a thing that would count as the public good. Okay. Um, I want to circle back, uh, some of the questions want to still circle back to, I guess, uh, the, the idea of uh, civic education, as I think, I mean, if you're thinking about ways of the, the um, uh, defining or getting to the public good, uh, any thoughts on what a high quality civic education would look like? And I guess the question must mean in terms of thinking about it at the various levels of um, our educational system. Absolutely. Um, so yes, no, I mean, I think um, I'll, putting this in, in really kind of the technical jargon, there's been a sort of split in the field of civic education for the last decade plus between the people who think that civic education is about mastering civic knowledge, the sort of traditional mm -hmm. content, three branches, uh, declaration, constitution, and so forth, and people who think that it's about scaffolding uh, the development of agency, the ability of young people to diagnose problems in their own community, and to know how to pull levers of change to, to bring about change in their community. And my answer is, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's merge those things, because the truth of the matter is you can't actually um, help shape the direction of your community if you don't understand how political institutions work. So you actually need that traditional core knowledge as a part of understanding um, the levers of change that you might want to pull as a, an active and engaged civic participant. So, um, I mean, there's a, the answer to the content varies somewhat over the course of, you know, K through 12 and higher ed, but the core thing is to recognize that you need to, um, we do need to deliver the sort of core knowledge about the institutions of constitutional democracy and what the justification is anyway for having this kind of cumbersome process of decision making and why do we think representation and participation matter for human well-being so if you need that whole conversation but it needs to be about putting knowledge to use as well about you know you the student the young person as an empowered civic actor with a set of commitments values, a sense of a civic identity that connects to your identities of various kinds and the ability to articulate what you care about and to think about how what you care about connects to a theory of change um, in the community that you live in. So that's an abstract answer. Um, we're doing a ton of K-12 curriculum work actually so I can you know send you in spades examples of sort of curricula that look like this but, um, but, but it's a hybrid of that content knowledge and the scaffolding of agency and experiences of agency. Okay. Um, do you think that the pandemic um, has changed or ha well, has it changed your understanding, right, of the, um, the relationship of the public and to the private? Um, and um, 
is there a delineation between public and private that um, uh, defines your thinking and your approach to uh, to this problem and to uh, the problems of uh, civic governance generally? So that's a super interesting question. Um, well, um, hmm, that's a good one. I don't know. Um, so I, uh, I mean, I think you can hear in my remarks, right, that I'm trying to help people see where problems are being misconceived as private problems when they're actually public problems, right? So and to some extent, it's, it makes sense that we are, we misconceive our need for safety and security as a private problem because the national government sort of threw up its hands and said, take care of yourselves, people, right? So then you repeat that gesture several layers, and the next thing you know, it's just like every individual family or person is trying to figure out how am I going to be safe? What should I do? Um, you know, does my business need to do testing just for my employees and so forth? So um, there, is the, there has been a kind of gesture towards privatization of this problem over the course of the pandemic. And I am arguing for seeing our problem as a public problem, a shared problem. So I think that's a thing to say. And that doesn't mean that um, I'm tossing privacy out, if that may be a kind of concern motivating the question. Um, you know, I think when I think about contact tracing and the way in which it maybe sits at that border between the private and the public, um, I think of it as, I mean, back to your actually example of neighbors mm -hmm. and neighborliness at the beginning, I think of contact tracing more or less as something neighbors do in support of each other. Um, like, hey neighbor, you know, be warned. Like I may have accidentally exposed you. I didn't mean to, uh, but please go get a test so you can figure out if you're accidentally exposing somebody else. So I do think of that as something that we owe each other. Um, and which is what happens at that boundary between private and public, right? Our private lives are never hermetically sealed off from the public and from civil society. So there's always a question of what we owe one another that sort of sits on the boundary of private and public. And I think that this uh, pandemic is um, challenging us because there are parts of the experience of it that do sit on that border between private and public. Now, in terms of, I think this is very helpful and it's, it seems to be touching something of a chord. Um, uh, one way to think about this, the relationship between the public and the private with respect to healthcare would be to, to raise the question whether, uh, you know, a long standing debate in our national politics about um, um, healthcare as such should uh, cash out in whether or not we should have a national healthcare service um, uh, of some, of, of some mm -hmm. sort. And, um, and um, if not, how could, um, um, how might you explain the benefit of our federalist approach to healthcare as opposed to say a national healthcare service? So um, I do think that we should, uh, so I do think that we should have um, universal access to healthcare. And for me, that means a combination of expanding Medicare and Medicaid um, so that they are available to all who need them. I don't think that you need to get rid of private insurance to do that. So I think you can have a hybrid um, public and private system that has everybody covered. So universal coverage, I think we absolutely need. Um, and so why have public-private hybrid? Isn't that more inefficient? I think the answer is yes, it is more inefficient. But it, only if you think about, you know, in, efficient for what, right? Is, is there a question you have to ask? So in other words, um, it is more inefficient if what you're paying attention to is just literally the dollars you're spending per person on healthcare. But is it more inefficient as a way of delivering a legitimate health system to a society? Where by legitimate, I mean, not only that it's providing coverage, but it's also uh, recognized as legitimate, encompassing other values like choice and freedom and things like that. So in other words, it strikes me that a hybrid health system may be literally more expensive in dollar terms, but delivering value for us of multiple kinds, the health kind, but also the kind that is about respecting the kind of culture and commitments that this society has. So in other words, so yes, I think we need universal health, but I don't think it's a kind of battle between a fully public system or a kind of fully private system. I think it's reasonable to have a hybrid system. So, um, and I do, you know, to have that kind of structure, you do need um, a support that is either federalist or national. 
Um, but I, because insofar as I'm interested in using the Medicare Medicaid system, that is state based, right? So ultimately, the kind of universal package that I'm pointing to would be a federalist one, it would depend on the states providing the universal piece um, supported by funding from the federal government. So it would be require activating all the tiers of the system um, with the private layer slotted in there as well. Okay. Uh, as I look at it, I think we're right at the end of our time. And I wanted to thank you in particular, be, uh, in light of that last question, for your willingness to wrangle with the specific specificities of uh, uh, particular issues in light of the broader uh, political uh, philosophy. Uh, aspects of political philosophy that you've asked us to think about. So I'd like to thank you once again and to thank all of you in attendance for your wonderful questions. Uh, this has been a marvelous uh, series of very timely lectures and we are enormously grateful to you, Danielle, for sharing your insights with us. And with that, this uh, brings us to the close of the Randy L. and Melvin R. Berlin Family Lectures for 2020. Um, and um, Applause again for uh, Danielle, oh, please. And to you, Ken. <laughs> and thank you, just thank you to everybody for those wonderful questions and the conversation. I truly appreciate it. Thank you again. It was really great to see you uh, and to have a, reason, have a reason to get out of a sweatsuit. Uh, I invite you <laughs> <laughs> to join us again next year for uh, the lectures when our guest speaker will be the acclaimed English tenor and music scholar Ian Bostridge. And now thank you again for all your attention and your time and good night.